Many centuries ago in Central America, the Maya built cities full of secrets. Why was this temple built on the edge of a cliff? What purpose did it serve? What strange rites were enacted in this underground chamber? And what dire penalty was paid by the players of this ancient ball game? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. In the 19th century, a journey like this was often a voyage of discovery. In many places, the jungle we are sailing through is dark and impenetrable, and every explorer wondered what ruins and treasures lay in its steamy heart. Here in Sri Lanka, two huge ancient cities were discovered, but perhaps the most remarkable find of that golden age was made in a jungle thousands of miles from here. From Central America came reports of a forgotten civilization skilled in writing, sculpture, and astronomy. These people, the Maya, were also the builders of spectacular monuments. Today, more than a century later, the mysteries they left are still being unraveled. Its towers, palaces, and pinnacles still engulfed by the jungle Tikal is just one of the vast cities from which the Maya ran their mighty empire. They held sway over vast tracts of Central America, in modern Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. Centuries before invaders from the Old World reached here, much of the Maya civilization had perished. But ancient stories give a few tantalizing clues to the glories of its past. Oh, yeah. These men are the guardians of one of the Maya's most treasured traditions. Great plazas dominate the landscapes of the ancient cities. They are ball courts. But the game here was more than sport. A hallowed ritual, its outcome was literally a matter of life and death. These men play just like their ancestors depicted on ancient Maya pottery. They strike the heavy rubber ball not with their feet, but with their hips. The ancient rules were endlessly complicated. By analyzing the clues, archaeologist Nicholas Helmut of Coco, Florida, has pieced together many details of the ancient game, but he still has countless questions. We'd like to know how often they played, who played, why. There must have been different levels of games. And why are the, are the courts so large? It must have been extremely important to them. Helmut believes the goals were the rings on each side of the court. It's very difficult to make a goal. Points were gained and lost in, in, in other manners. But the ring was a, was a grand slam. If you got the ball through the ring, you got to get the jewelry of everybody in the audience. But the audience had the right to flee. We know that because the Spanish saw the game and made notes on it. There are some suggestions there was a gladiatorial aspect, that people were captured in battle and brought into the court and had to fight it out, either against the home team or possibly even two teams of gladiators. It was definitely more than a game because the court was considered a temple. And of course, at the end of the game, one or more people of the team was, was sacrificed. It was literally a game to the death. To Helmut, Maya art poses one last unanswered question. Players of the past are shown wearing a strange yoke-like belt around their waist. Often found near ball courts, no one knows for sure what the stone yokes were for. Helmut decided to conduct a weighty experiment. Well, I believe that these were actually worn in the game, not just in ceremonies, because uh, the art shows us, and the best way to demonstrate that is to put a yoke on. I mean, they are heavy. 
but they balance. That's the important thing. They balance perfectly. And they don't require any type of attachment. They fit on sideways. That's the correct way to fit on. It's not uncomfortable at all. You can make all the movements. You can get down, move up, and it stays on the whole time. The biggest problem would be the position down on the court floor because they have to go down and then get back up very quickly. But I think if they were trained, and I think if they were going to lose their head if they didn't do it, I think they could do it. But in a local market, a different theory is under investigation. Archaeologist Reina de Vries has enlisted the help of a Mexican leather worker, hoping to show that her idea is the most practical. Inspiration struck at an exhibition in her native Holland. When I took my husband to the, to the museum, to the ball game exposition, I told him about the theories which uh, exist about the stone yokes, and I told him that uh, many people think they were actually worn during the game. And then he said, but when they use leather nowadays, why can, can it be possible that the stone yokes were molds to make leather belts to, to use in the ball game? Rayner suggests that the Maya used wet leather tightly molded round the yokes. Once dried in the sun, the leather would hold the design of the yoke and could be stuffed with sawdust and sewn into shape. I think a leather yoke will be better because a stone yoke is very heavy. Their weight is between 20 and 30 kilos and it's really very heavy to, to play it in a very active and agile a ball game. <laughs> <laughs> a slimline volunteer puts Helmut's theory to a practical test. ¿Qué, ¿Qué diferencia usando la, diría, la piedra? Bueno, yo pienso que sí se puede lanzar más lejos este, acostumbrándose a, la, a ella. Yes, he thinks that, uh, especially when you became accustomed to using that, you could get the ball much further using a yoke, and that's the purpose of the yoke. That's why it's stone, that's why it has to be heavy. So far, so good for Helmut, but Reina has high hopes for her leather version. I'm really very pleased with this yoke, with this copy, because it took exactly the same form as the stone yoke. It even had the reliefs exactly as the original mold. It's much uh, lighter than the stone yoke, but it's tough, it's, it's hard. Only the players can tell if Reina's idea is a winner. Just a few hits and the leather is dented out of shape. Discúlpeme, ¿qué piensa usted de ese cinturón de cuero? Pues opino que es muy blando para para la pelota porque es muy dura. He says that it's maybe too soft, uh, not hard enough to hit the ball for. ¿Cuál sería mejor? So which yoke does the team prefer? Pues de piedra. Me voy con la piedra. Para que rinda más. He says he he is imagining that maybe the stone will hit faster. Knowing the popularity of human sacrifice in ancient South America, one wonders what happened to the losers in this game. There's even a theory that the winners were eager to be sacrificed so that they could go straight to the Mayan heaven. I'm happy to offer either version to any TV station which is losing ratings on its sports coverage. Well, it wasn't too difficult to discover the purpose of the ball courts, but much more puzzling are the curiously shaped pits scattered throughout the Mayan cities. The pits are known as shultuns. At Tikal, they're found all around the edge of the majestic ruins, concealed by the encroaching jungle.
Deep in the tropical forest, ethnobotanist Bill Litzinger from Arizona believes he knows why the Maya dug these mysterious holes. His Guatemalan guides have directed him to a classic shultoon. Clearly man-made, the pit seemed to have been designed with a purpose. The Choltun is a, is a hole that, that the ancient Mayas made around their dwellings. Generally, they're um, about two meters deep, and uh, the chamber is maybe a meter to a meter and a half high inside. Most people believe that the Choltuns were storehouses for food, hoarded against times of famine. But they are hot, humid, and popular with bats. Litzinger has his doubts. When we do find them, we often find four or five at one house, and then the surrounding houses have none. And that doesn't really uh, seem to make much sense when you're thinking about storing food. You'd think every house would have its own storage. Some people think that they were used for trash or latrines, but none of these ideas are supported with good evidence. An expert in brewing and winemaking, Litzinger believes the Maya made a virtue of the Shultun's fetid atmosphere and used them as fermenting chambers. Following an ancient recipe, he hopes to brew Mayan honey wine. Put it into the uh, oil. I think that's good. A couple of handfuls of, of these flowers. This is uh, of hibiscus flowers. We'll put plenty in there. Now I'm going to add the yeast, which I've already mixed up in some water here. I'm using a lot of yeast just to give it a good start. Litzinger is risking his health in the name of science. The bats that inhabit the Shultuns can cause serious disease, and a face mask is his only protection. Okay. The wine is left overnight to ferment in the Shultuns' murky depths. Next morning, happy hour comes early. Well, it uh, looks it looks good, and uh, I think we had we had had good success, and I think the really the proof is in the tasting. So why don't I? Let's give it a taste. Mm. It's good. It's got a, a nice acrid flavor, a little bit of flavor from the flower, and um, it's very slightly alcoholic. I, I think it's a, an excellent possibility The Maya were making wine in the Choltuns. Unlike most ancient peoples, the Maya left masses of writing and covered their cities with inscriptions. If we could only read all of them, we would have the answers to many mysteries. One of the key breakthroughs in cracking the Mayan code has come from a unique combination of archaeology and gastronomy. Archaeologist David Stewart is on the last leg of a journey from Harvard, Massachusetts to one of his favorite places in Central America. Hidden away in northern Honduras is the ruined city of Copan. These stones tell tales of its heyday 1,300 years ago, mute witnesses to Central America's golden age. Carved lettering called glyphs is everywhere. These messages from the Maya have lain unread for centuries. Copan's most famous symbol is a history book written in glyphs. Carved in stone, the hieroglyphic staircase holds the secrets of a civilization. 
And now the hieroglyphic stairway is one of the most amazing monuments, I think, from the ancient world, because every step has an inscription that gives us some of the history of Copan, information about the kings and their lives. So it's an extremely important monument for understanding something about the world here at Copan in ancient times. There are signs that are very pictorial that are representing animals and faces and body parts, and they combine together uh, to spell words, essentially. Over the years, it's been a, a great challenge deciphering Maya glyphs. First of all, it doesn't look quite like a writing system that we're used to. It, I think it's taken a long time for specialists to really understand the nuances and the system behind this really incredible way of writing. So I think it's going to take generations still to understand you know, most of what we find here at Copan and other sites. In the modern bustle of Guatemala City, Stuart came across a clue which may speed up his quest for understanding. The city's museum houses a unique treasure found in the tomb of a Mayan noble. This simple pot is adorned with cryptic glyphs. Besides its special decoration, the pot has another claim to fame. It is the first known example of a screw-top jar. The glyph that first caught my eye was one over here on the lid, which is seen right here. And this is a glyph that we find on all sorts of Maya vessels that basically says, his drinking cup. But in this case, they added some extra information. Because as we read around the lid, we find here that it's beginning to give us the recipe of the contents. This first sign that you see over here, this comb-like element, was first recorded by the Spanish back in the 16th century, and that is the syllable ca. A little detective work in recent years has shown that the ca sign, this comb, can also be written in the form of a fish. So we read both of these as the same sound, ka, ka. And then the last sign below it, right here, we know from other lines of evidence is pronounced wa. So together it's ka, ka. Stuart knew cacao was the Mayan word for cocoa. He also knew the one place he could find confirmation, Chocolate Town, USA. Hershey's senior research chemist is Jeffrey Hurst. I, I was really excited. I mean, this is really a neat opportunity. They looked to us to help, you know, determine if in fact this material that they found inside was cocoa. Stewart sent Hurst scrapings he found at the bottom of the pot. I opened the box and found a number of vials of material that surely didn't resemble cocoa to me from my first look. The anonymous brown powder was subjected to a battery of tests to determine its composition. Two ingredients unique to chocolate showed up. Stuart's hunch had been spot on. The pot had indeed contained Mayan cocoa. It's a sample that nobody had touched for 1,100 years or something close to that. I, I was excited, it was neat, uh, but I was honored also to be able to participate as part of the, the project team. Reading the glyphs and being able to decipher them is, I think, a real key to so many aspects of Maya civilization. Not only reading the history, the names and dates, which is kind of, kind of a dry aspect of it, but also, I mean, we can learn so much about Maya religion, uh, Maya ritual behavior, um, their society at large. Uh, not just about the kings, they're talking about bigger issues and bigger questions that concern them. And what's so important is it's their own voice. I mean, we're really uh, bridging a gap of 1,500 years, listening to what they had to say about their own civilization. Mamasudi. What a strange but fruitful alliance of scientific disciplines. And that seems to be the trick for solving Mayan mysteries. Here's how a sailor and an archaeologist succeeded in casting light upon another.
One of Mexico's most dazzling beaches lies beside the ruined Mayan city of Tulum. Walled in on three sides and protected by the sea on the fourth, Tulum was a fortress, dominated by one building, the Castillo, perched right on the cliff edge. What was it for, wondered local seaman Michael Creamer. I was taking a swim out in front of the Castillo at Tulum, and I noticed that it had a pair of windows facing seawards. One is square, let's say about 45 by 45 centimeters, and that was long and narrow. They were absolutely distinct, different, and uh, I couldn't believe that was an accident or sloppy workmanship, and there must have been a reason for that. The other thing about the upper windows at Tulum is the walls are quite thick, and what this does is any light that might be behind them is now in a column, okay? And when you pass by the, that column, the light is completely cut off. It's like looking through a tube. Creamer considered the Castillo's position. Offshore lies a deadly reef, whose sharp corals lie only inches beneath the surface. For sailors, it's an accident waiting to happen. You could easily swamp the boat, drown the passengers, lose the cargo, crash on the reef. And I don't think even the bravest and intrepid Mayan navigator would want to go through that reef opening without some kind of guide. There is only one safe passage from reef to shore, but at deck level, the dark clumps of coral are hard to see. Creamer believes the reef and the Castillo are linked. In the daytime, the sun shines through two gaps in the temple's stonework, directly opposite the reef's safe entrance. Creamer's hunch is that the upper windows were used after dark, that the temple doubled as a lighthouse. On shore, Creamer's wife Greta and Mexican archaeologist Pilar Luna will be lighthouse keepers. We need to take a look at these at the next buoy, uh, Javier. Let's see what this looks like, this coral. The lamps carried into the Castillo's upper chamber will simulate Mayan fire. Okay, okay, we're in good position now. Please turn the lights on, Pilar. Please turn the lights on. Okay. Creamer's idea is that the design of the windows was carefully calculated. He expects that both lights can be seen together only when it's safe to turn. A uh, Mayan canoe of the year 1000 would be looking at the Castillo and hoping that somebody remembered to turn on the lights. As we approach, we'll first see a light uh, showing up in the north window, in that wider window I talked about. And then, when the light begins to appear in the second window, then we know we're in the safe channel. That's the moment to make the turn. It's just coming up now in the wide window. Can you see it? Okay, well, just in a minute, the next window will appear. It'll be time to put those oars and paddles in the water and make your turn. Here we go, there we are now is it, we're in it, we're in the channel. Now you can also see that the day signals are still functioning with a little sunset behind them. I believe you can see that. But the acid test comes in the dark of night. Creamer hopes the lights in the two windows can be trusted to guide him to shore. Here we come. Now uh, we hope this works because this is going through the reef. Here we go. Ready. Here it comes. Okay, go. Make your turn now, Javier. Very good. Now, you see how the lights are equally brilliant? Keep them exactly like that. Very good. OK, you're right on it, right on the money. Very good. OK, you see those two lights still? OK. Same intensity. That's perfect, perfect. OK. OK, we're through the reef. We can safely head for the beach now. We're through it all. There's, there's nothing uh, that, can, that can hurt the boat now. I feel great about this evening's work. I think we did a great job. As far as I'm concerned, we absolutely proved it. The windows were not an accident. There are different shapes for a reason. The Mayans did a great job in engineering, and I suppose they're great seamen too. I've long been interested in the Maya, not least because they may have crafted the extraordinary crystal skull, which watches over our series. But for all its glories, the Mayan civilization suddenly collapsed. Its great cities were swallowed up by the jungle. Why did it happen? Well, I can give you a simple answer. Nobody knows. And that's the greatest of all the mysteries left us by the Maya. 